An undisclosed institute of higher learning, this is the Jake Feinberg Show, and we're happy you could be part of the program today. The foundations of a human being begin within their home. The education, the adherence to a craft, and not overcompensating with blind faith. My guest today had a bedrock in his home, and it is because of his mother that he is where he is today. Part of the Jake Feinberg Show is to promote inclusivity as it relates to parents and their relationships with their children. I do this by talking musicians like my guest, who under the tutelage of Irma, gained an education through world experience, world sound, and melodic invention. My guest was enlightened to the Creator and their impact on this earth by an apparatus, a horn that emits sequences of ideas and streams of knowledge that is at the core of true music. The ability to heal and dance, to settle disputes through universal communication, to build a bridge to a new era after they themselves reached the bottom of the pit. What started with his mom led to Raymond Pounds, Elvin Jones, and McCoy Tyner, who, like Van Morrison and Bob Marley, played music that transcended this orbit. McCoy's band was tight-knit, my guest, Junie Booth and Alphonse Mouzon, who he plays with today in Southern California with two other sages in spirit, Theo Saunders and the skipper, Henry Franklin. I witnessed my guest playing at the RG Club in Venice and the Seabird Chicken and Waffles establishment in Long Beach back in July. I rocked back and forth to the undulating rhythms while my guest danced around the African juju with long improvisational riffs that make you think and think even more when you don't want to think anymore. He has bands on both coasts and seems to be rising on the burning shore before we all check out. Quoting my guest, If you win one battle over yourself, that's how you can experience growth. Amen. Azar Lawrence, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Thank Show. Thank you very much. Here I am, guys. <laughs> it's, nice to, it's nice to have you, man. Thanks for having me, man, uh, and uh, I want to say uh, thanks to all the listeners for listening in, supporting you, and supporting the music. I uh, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I, I sat down with uh, Harold Johnson uh, over at the uh, yeah. a, a church in in Southern California, and 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 I was stunned because we spent a long time early on. He was talking about your mother and her significance in his life because at the time when he was growing up his folks were very devoted to the church and your mom was very educated already and was basically explaining to him well that's all good but you also have to take care of your passion and you and and your duties on this planet and i just would like you to talk a little bit about uh, your mom as a leader uh, for not just yourself, but obviously for people like Harold, all these other students. Well, okay. First, uh, uh, we pronounce your name Ima. Ima. Uh, Ima Lawrence. Uh, Ima Jean Lawrence, and which is you know one of the southern names there. And she was uh, she was very uh, musical uh, and very instrumental in uh, Harold's life, my life, and uh, and as a, a school teacher. I've run across many uh, people uh, that she's uh, become, it was a pivotal point in their lives. Uh, there's a health food store, for instance, uh, in Los Angeles called Simply Wholesome. And uh, for some time I had, uh, you know, said hi to the manager for a girl named, by the name of April. And one day, uh, you know, she said she overheard her mother who taught at uh this uh, Menlo uh, Avenue school and where she went and uh, and my mother used to teach her in some kind of way my when her mother heard, heard overheard her use my name speak my name she said Azar her mother's name is Ima and uh, they ended right, they made the connection and oh boy it's just like she was saying that the reason the girl April was saying that the reason that she holds herself in such poise and uh, uh, confidence is due to what my mother had taught her and Anyway, she was like that kind of, uh, uh, you know, woman. The, coming up in Oklahoma, you know, uh, they said that 
she was the type of pianist that when they went to the movies, that at that time uh, the movies had live uh, live musicians. Of course, uh, right, 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 right. When she would come back, she could play everything she heard. <laughs> so just from your memory, yeah, she was like that. So uh, I used to uh, hear her practice uh, when I was uh, very young. I mean, I mean, in a diaper stage. And when she, when, when I would take naps, she put me down for naps. That's when she would practice. And I always remember hearing her play Chopin or uh, Bach or uh, the, you know, warming up on the hand and exercise. And, and uh, you know, she taught uh, piano after after the she got out of class. After the in, at the end of the day, after three, starting around four o'clock, she would uh, make rounds and go and uh, to people's homes giving music lessons. And, then we she would uh, have recitals uh, during the summer every year, and uh, she started my brother and myself. Vincent uh, started us off on piano, and uh, at a very young age. Uh, oh, I know. And then I ended up on violin. I, I started actually. Want, I wanted to play drums, but uh, we owned a, a, a five flex, and at the time there was a family, uh, a large family that stayed in the main place downstairs, and we were upstairs and. We quickly found out that practicing those drums wasn't going to work for us. You know? <laughs> no, so you know. I ended up, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. What were you going to say? Well, no. I, I, what Harold and I talked about a lot, and I just think it's important uh, because its individuality is 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 so important now in our society. I mean, it's one of the things that um, you know when you go back and you listen to Coltrane, Sonny Rollins. <laughs> Uh, all these titans, you know, uh, the drummers, Tony Williams, uh, Larry Young, all these cats, they all sounded different, okay? They all had their own individual sound. And what your mom was telling Harold was, you know, don't bury your head in the sand. I mean, just right. be yourself. And I just would, you know, talk to younger musicians, people that listen to the show, about being how important it is to be yourself and to to have realistic expectations but most importantly be an individual especially in music that's very true well you know and then that's uh something that emerges in uh in a given time and uh, elvin jones t uh, told me he said to take my time he said don't take anyone else's time take your time to get to where you're going with it and you know and i guess not to be rushed but uh to do what it takes to do it you know which is you know uh discipline and uh everyday practice you know at your craft so that's that's the bottom line of it you know you have to whatever you're going to be uh, a surgeon or a painter or artist uh, of any type or what is you know whatever craft it is that you must develop in your life work here's the thing but what but, but and, and I'm, this is what i'm trying to get at is that from from a uh, from your mom's point of view uh being somebody who was part of the urban league uh way before right. anybody knew about the urban league who was educated and understood the kinds of trials and tribulations that your people went through uh, to right. me, it was like, you know, when you look at McCoy and Sonny and yourself, John Coltrane, it's the individual. I mean, I understand mathematics is part of it, but what about the history of your people? And that's what I'm, I guess that's what I'm getting at is how do you, how did you, aside from practicing, um, how do you develop that transcendental sound and that, those sequencing of ideas? I mean, is it, is it even, can you even put it into words? Well, yeah, that's the, like I said, uh, that is something that's developed through time, discipline, usage of time, uh, developing your craft and connecting uh, your self, your individuality through uh, a certain medium. And mine happens to be music, but whatever craft you're utilizing, you know, uh, let's speak in an a artistic manner. And whatever medium it is that you're going to express yourself through, the way that you can to become one 
with it and utilize it uh, as a tool of expression is to discipline. And that's what she taught was that it was everyday discipline. And uh, actually, I ran into a friend of mine the other day that reminded me, he said, you remember what your mother used to uh, say when we used to come by to see if you could play? And, you know, I had been already thinking about that. I can hear her voice still to this day saying, no, he can't come out until he practices. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I could hear their voice in the back. Uh, I could I'd be in the back of the house. And I, can Azar come out and play? No, he can't come out until he practices. Take back in about two hours. You know, and so... Uh, that was the the discipline. John Coltrane's discipline was very intense uh, from what we hear. I didn't know the man, uh, but from the, all the people that I performed with that knew him and and uh, that were around him said that he uh, you know, was always doing something. Like McCoy said, uh, he remembers that when they were on the road, if he went to his hotel room or whatever, he was always doing, uh, practicing, always working on something. So, you know, musically in on the instrument. and Because if you just put your instrument down, whatever it is, and don't touch it for a period of time, the longer it is, the more that instrument becomes a piece of wood or a piece of metal. It's an inanimate object. But the more you connect with it, you know, uh, daily, then the more it becomes a part of you. Or you can manipulate it to uh, and bring yourself and, uh, you know, project your your thoughts through it it becomes one with you and you know you kind of merge with it in terms of the atomic level you know the atoms uh you become uh having a uh, an affinity with it and uh, but like i said if i put the saxophone down for more than overnight and even then when you that's why you have to pick the pick it up the next day because, uh, you know, if you put it down too long, then it's just a piece of metal. You know, uh, it, I, it's really well said. I, I, is it is uh, part of picking it up every day for you just the good fortune of, of being able to play, having so many, uh, you talk about melodic invention, uh, you know, for uh, the type of music that you play, um, part of it is just the opportunity to play live. And you have a lot, a lot of live opportunities to play. And... Um, and you know it's that, that that's you know that was that that's some something that I feel like younger musicians to develop their individual sound need to be able to get comfortable playing in front of three people in a bar or a barn or a hockey hall, and those places don't exist as prevalent as uh, they weren't as prevalent as they were back in the late '60s and early '70s with this Afro-Cuban uh, you know smorgasbord of Southern California that you were experiencing. Um, That's very cool. You know, I mean, I, I just to to me, I say if pra, pra, part of it is you got to practice in your room. You know, I mean, I see the skipper right. playing his scales and he's practicing because it'll humble you. But what about live? Play? Is that practice too? Is that also? Well, Go ahead. Well, there is a phase of, of course, like you said, um, you have to practice doing whatever you're doing. And so, in other words, to play in front of people, you have to to do it. You have to do whatever you're doing. If you're gonna just to play the instrument itself. You have to do your individual practice. Then the phase of uh, performing in front of people, getting past the stage fright and the butterflies and the stomach and, and the lack of, you know, and, and developing the confidence, then that has to uh, to uh, be done to, to in order to do it. You have to do that regularly. And like you said, I have been quite fortunate enough to, uh, uh, in the sense that the performance experience, has been uh, something that I've worked at, and it, you know, and it's manifesting. For instance, like uh, we moved into the Baldwin Hills area of Los Angeles, which was at the time and still is a very nice uh, upper middle class area. You know, uh, it's not Beverly Hills, but uh, it's very <laughs> right. It's home. nice. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, very beautiful. And uh, we moved it there at a time that. Uh, uh, there weren't very many people of color up there, and uh, right before John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and so, uh, but we had a nice home, a pool, and uh, and that's how I grew up. But the thing is, uh, we had a baby grand piano, and uh, I used to have sessions over my house regularly, uh, even on school nights. And uh, you know, my father was also very supportive, and uh, uh, in a very uh, heavy way. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, when I needed an instrument, he got the instrument, 
you know, he made sure uh, that the, the the horn teacher was paid. And I mean, you know, he's right there too. But my mother, uh, when it got late, he was she was saying, "Hey, you know, we we are paying the bills here. I hope somebody does say something about uh, the neighbors." You know, she was getting very aggressive about that. When I asked, "Hey, can we go another little hour or something?" And then, I mean, this is a school night in high school. We were going to eleven, you know, and uh, sometimes twelve, and and uh, uh, she didn't want to hear nothing about somebody complaining about it. You That's know? so refreshing to hear. Your dad was your biggest fan. I mean, he he did everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, that to me, Azar, it's you know, it, it, your career has been striking for so many reasons. A lot of it has been, and again, one of the themes of a show that I'm putting together is about leadership. And one of the greatest leaders in my mind, even though I don't really, I never met him, I never knew him, but I know from guys like Roberto Miranda is that uh, Horace Tapscott was right. a serious, serious figure. He's one of these guys. I don't, I don't know if these people exist in our culture anymore. I, I don't. Maybe, maybe you can educate me about this. But he stood for so much more than just, you know, tinkling the ivories. I mean, the guy. This, if oh, you, yeah. if you could talk a little bit about the metaphysical studies and the Aquarian Spiritual Center that you went to, and just Horace's the way he carried himself and how he always tried to educate you guys as an elder. Well, that's a very good point because uh, I remember my first experience uh, through the Strader brothers, Ray and Ernest Strader. Uh, I was introduced. To, I forgot how I met them, but uh, we became friends, and uh, um, that's how I was uh, introduced. Well, you know what? Let me back up. Reggie Golson, Benny Golson's son, and I became very good friends. And I think I met him at, somehow. I went to uh, Horace Taft Scott. Uh, the, Fauché, he on Sundays he was doing these uh, free concerts at Fauché, and I went there, and I, that's how I met uh, everyone. And anyway, so I ended up through the Strata Brothers and uh, Reggie Golson meeting Horace, and uh, and uh, he brought me into the. I mean, I was 16, uh, and um, he next thing you know, since Arthur Blythe was uh, the sax, alto saxophonist and Will Carnell, uh, I was able to fit in the band playing baritone. <laughs> and so yeah, I thought I was the baritone there <laughs> in the band. Oh man, and it was such an experience. I mean, Arthur Blythe, of course, you know, at the time was known as Black Arthur, and uh, he uh, was so uh, informative. I would go by his house, and you know, uh, I was playing alto at the time. I was an alto player as well, and uh, he uh, just was very in instructive in terms of how to get that wonderful, beautiful sound that he was getting. But Horace, as well as uh, uh, a great uh, musical uh, game of light, was also a, a father figure to a lot of people, uh, so he gave, was giving young people, uh, young musicians a chance, and always was giving young, uh, younger musicians. When you reach a certain uh, level of, of musical maturity, then you know, uh, if you were blessed enough to, to have met him, then you, he would in, in, induct you into the, uh, or you could join the, the, the orchestra. And it was a whole family community, and uh, it was a family type of uh, approach to it. And I remember this one time over, uh, we had a rehearsal over the Horace's house, and he had a new song. And, oh man, I don't even remember the name of the song, but it was so beautiful. But the way, he didn't have it written on manuscript. It was like he must have gone out to an empty lot and got where they had destroyed a house and all these different odd pieces of uh, wood. Wow. Uh, on the paint, he had, on the painted side, he had written the, uh, written the, uh, the individual parts. And so we had, each person had a piece of the house, a piece of wood with the paint on it, with a chart written on it. And I was like, <laughs> Oh man! No, but it's so indigenous, life. though. I mean, that, that's this when I when I hear about this stuff, I'm like, metaphysical studies and a Aquarian spiritual center. I mean, it's mixing the spirit, which is I mean, music and magic, only separated by two letters, right? I mean, that's the point. Is that I I mean, these guys, Tapscott was a musician, and he was a leader. Coltrane was the same way. McCoy's the same way. I mean, you know. I look at that time, especially when you were just coming of age, and I said, you know, it was never easy. 
guys, Joe Williams was sleeping in, in, in alleyways in New York City. I mean, it was hard, but there was, there was a brotherhood. The Skipper talks about it, too. And I, and I see, the, and I, I wonder today, fast forwarding, at least with the West Coast band, those guys, Alphonse and, and Theo and, and, and the Skipper, those guys are all part of that linkage. And I, and I, is that what you're trying to, is that part of what you're trying to do is bring back that brotherhood a little bit? Because it was, there was so much love back then, man. Right, right. Well, you know, we're trying to maintain a brotherhood, uh, for sure. And, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's gone anywhere, uh, because it hasn't gone anywhere with us. But, uh, yeah, there's a, a bond, uh, that we, uh, uh, tr- you know, uh, exist or live with and live through and are a part of and, you know, uh, feed it and it feeds us. And uh, as far as the Cran Spiritual Center, uh, Dr. Alfred Lagan had one of the uh, the largest, uh, most well-equipped African-American bookstores in the country. And, of course, part of those uh, books uh, were of an occult nature, which, uh, you know, are metaphysical nature, which means all just to uh, beyond the physical. Right, of course. And, yeah, and so uh wasn't any spookism, and, and it was <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, how one can become acquainted with their own true self. It's what the whole bottom basic, uh, the basic bottom line was, the instructions were to how uh, how one could become acquainted with their their own true self, and of course, then their higher self uh, would, you know, be what we would try to uh, um, most acquaint ourselves with. <laughs> you know, absolutely no, and I, I just think it was—it's just—it's the component of education, which going back to your mother was also. I just, I, you know, and I, I just feel like education is is kind of one of those things where uh, there was a lot of street learning, uh, a lot of experiential learning, and you had these guys like Horace. Bobby Bradford, uh, John Carter, uh, just, right. I mean, it was self-determination based on right. the, the trials and tribulations of your people. And Woody Shaw, this, I thought you were going to say that Horace had everything in his head, which is the way Woody Shaw used to be, with, you know, where he'd have some, everything was in his head. There was nothing written out. It was just, right, right, right. to me, um, you know, but, but, but not to get too esoteric here, I, I, uh, I wanted to ask you before we play a clip of music, can you tell me how you wound up playing with Eric Burden in War? That was interesting. Uh, well, there was two uh, repair people that uh, were well-known uh, to all the great musicians. Uh, Mac McLaughlin was the horn repair man, par excellence, and Glenn Johnson was a great classical uh, clarinetist, but he was a mouthpiece maker and repairman par excellence. And they both studied under Max, Max McLaughlin's father during the time of the Depression, who, who had a music store, from what I understand. And uh, I mean, everybody, trained, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, everybody would go to Max McLaughlin. And the way his, the, the way he... Uh, did things differently is he used instead of a light sometimes he would drop a light down but in your horn to see the leaks uh but he used a cigarette paper which was so many milli, you know uh fractions of a of a of an inch or whatever mm-hmm, right of a, you know some small uh fraction and you know he would tug on it and if he slipped through the you know when he put pressure on the key you know he would tug a lot around the key to make sure that it was sealing but at any rate, uh, I used to go to Glenn Johnson, and he kept me straight mouthpiece-wise. He would say, yeah, if you want to want it to sound like the human voice? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and he, yeah, he would go to work, man, and oh, man. I was up there trying a mouthpiece one time, and his grandson came in uh, from there, because uh, he had a workshop outside, up up in Hollywood Hills, up, like I guess where the garage would have been. And so his grandson came in and they said, man, I really love your sound. He said, I'm working with a guy named Eric Burton, man. And I came up a surfer and my brother and uh, up in Bone Hills there, like I said, wasn't very many people of color. And all our friends, we were surfers and, and uh, rock and roll. I mean, I grew up on the Fresh Cream and Jimi Hendrix and, 
you know, uh, absolutely, the, the, uh, the Star uh, Jefferson airplane, and you know, I mean, all of that. So, uh, and Eric Burden and animals. I my brother took me. All, my brother's older, and I used to hang out with him all the time. And we went out to this place called the Cheetah out in Venice Beach, uh, and uh, saw the animals. And so I knew where Eric Burden was right away. And, and so he said, yeah, man, I bet you we're putting a group together and I bet you it would be just perfect. I love your sound. So he, he invited me to come over and uh, and I uh, played with him. And uh, Eric <laughs> Eric said, man, I love your sound. He said, uh, he said, but what I want to do is just come by every week on Friday here to Far Out, Far Out Studios. To, you know, that's, that's where they had the, it was on Sunset where we rehearsed. And uh, they come by and pick up a check. He said, because I'm going to need about a month or so to uh, to form the group. He fired everybody, including the guy that brought me there. <laughs> and I just <laughs> I went by and picked up a check, and then he called me, and uh, uh, and it was uh, he was forming war. Wow, he was forming and war at this time, right at this time. At that time, unbelievable. Oh man, and I was playing with the uh, Watson Hundred Third Street band, Charles Wright, who actually came to my performance the other night at the Seabird uh, Jazz Lounge you know, Dad's Club, which is uh, part of the Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles Complex in Long Beach. It's a great it's a great venue. i got to be honest. I was there. It was fantastic. It was great. It was wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, man. So, uh... i gotta be, I got to ask you right off the... Did, 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 was Papa D there with you? Like, right away with the with the Congo drums? I mean, was it the original group? I, this is, this is my, part of history, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think he was there. We didn't have any Congos at the time. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. No, it was right before then. So, you know, I was working with uh, What's on the Third Street Band, Charles Wright, at the same time. And every Tuesday and Thursday from 2, uh, 2 a.m. to 6 uh, a.m., I played after hours at uh, this club that uh, Candy Finch, who was a drummer that played with Dizzy Gillespie for five years. Oh, sure. And, yeah, uh, Candy and uh, uh, Larry Gale, the bass player from Monk. Yeah, he had a coffee Gale. house in L.A. there. Yeah, yeah, well, I used to play there Tuesday and Thursday, uh, every Tuesday night and the Thursday night. One night they'd pay us, and one other night they'd feed us. And it was uh, Woody Shaw, George Cables, and uh, uh, myself with uh, Larry Gale on bass and um, Candy Finch on, on drums. And man, I, I learned so much from them. Can you imagine those guys? Larry, I didn't really, they just kept saying, yeah, he played with Monk. But I didn't realize till now, I mean, until I got older, how significant he was. It was, you know, and those guys uh, nurtured me. And uh, his uh, widow, uh, you know, still carries on the tradition of the, uh, you know, these uh, ladies uh, uh, the jazz. Absolutely. I, I, I promoted a concert uh, a few years ago for the late, great Gene Russell, the piano player. Uh, and the, yeah. and uh, and she was in attendance because uh, so many of those guys like Calvin Keys and yourself, yeah. and they, they all played at his coffee house. So, you know, at, you know, let's. Uh, so Azar Lawrence, uh, you know, we're, we're going to go back just I want to play this track of music here for a minute and uh, and then we'll come back and talk about it. OK. OK.
Okay. Uh, yeah. We, we we play a we play a game on the show called Name That Name That Tune, but I I'd like you to take a crack at that. Or well, you know, I don't remember what the name of that song was, but I I know the melody. I mean, I'm playing it, right? <laughs> so, I, I know, you know, uh, I, I know uh, that's when uh, I don't even remember the what song, what album that was on. Well, this is the thing. Right? I, I'm just going to tell you this. Uh, uh, that was uh, the McCoy Tyner Quintet live. It was a liberated bootleg from Par- Paris. That song. Uh-huh. That song was called Sahara Love Bassa. That was uh-huh, M- uh-huh. McCoy, Azar, Junie Booth, uh, a drummer, Wilby Fletcher, yeah. a- and then a guy who I really want to talk to you about in part two is Guillermo Franco, Antonio Franco. Yeah, Guillermo Gilear- Franco. Is he still around? Because I got to find that cat. I mean, where is he? He's in Brazil. He went back to Brazil. You know, if, I heard. I mean, That's this I heard. The, the, the date of this is 1970. Does that sound right? Were you with McCoy in 70? That was me, man. But I uh, that wasn't seventy. That was glare. Uh, no, man. Uh, uh, no, I graduated from high school in seventy. <laughs> it was later. Than, no, it was that, that was me. That was Will B. And that was all of us. But uh, that was later than that, man. That had to have been like around seventy four. Well, you know what it is, Atlantis. I mean, if you Atlantis came out seventy four because they, the first track was Atlantis. Second track was Sahara Love Bossa. Oh yeah, it was after. Yeah, it had to have been after seventy four. And with Will, Wilby wasn't in the in the band until uh, uh, he left and came back. Yeah, uh, so Wilby was there and get at me because when I first got in the band, it was just a quartet with Alphonse and uh, Juni. Then we went through everybody. But yeah, man, let's pick it up again. I, see, I'm sitting in Beverly Hills. I was up at uh, Warren Cucarolo's house. Uh, I mean, at, at Paul Allen, the, uh, the guy from uh, Microsoft, Bill Gates's uh, partner. Who has a wonderful studio and uh, Warren Kukulula from uh, from Duran Duran uh, is a big fan of mine and uh, we ended on to uh, we did a, we're doing an album and uh, it really came out good kind of like Bitches Brew it's <laughs> yeah it's nice man and so uh, I'm I came down uh, another Brazilian percussionist my Uto career was uh, I mentioned his name yesterday and so wanted to bring him on up so. He got lost, and I was coming. I had driven down to see where he was, and of course, I guess he's made it. Hopefully, by now out there, because it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty intricate. Well, my, I saw Mayuto with you at the RG Club. The guy was like the thousand fingered man. It was ridiculous. He was on fire. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, he is. He's off the chain. Well, listen, Azar, I uh, I really appreciate you taking the time, uh, and and let's try to plan a part two in the near future so we can put this back together because we got a lot more to get to. Okay, I appreciate it, brother. All right, brother. You be good now. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. This is Jake Feinberg Show. We'll see you all in a little bit.